let's come over to the color um, uh, tab now. So we've uh, basically looked at most of the sliders in that um, uh, light tab. Now we are below the light tab we have the color tab. Now there is a little eyedropper tool, it's called the white balance selector. You can tap it uh, with your finger and then move your finger into the image and select a tone that is neutral. And what I mean by neutral, it is a tone of grey, it doesn't actually have any colour. This is a way of selecting um, a correct white balance in the image. I have to say it's very hit and miss uh, unless you're working with a white balance reference card. Uh, so I typically do not use this tool unless I have a white balance reference card to actually click on. You might think you're able just to click on a white shirt or, um, or a grey shirt, but generally those tones will soak up a little bit of the neighbouring colour. And so you might click on them thinking it will cr uh, correct your image, but often the image will go very warm or very cool just to show you that neutral tone which you perceive to be neutral is actually a little bit warm or cool and should be left that way. Most uh, photographers are actually using auto white balance uh, set in their cameras and we do have uh, auto white balance that can be set in Lightroom as well. Now if we've used auto white balance in the camera uh, the image will open up as as shot. This means it's using the white balance reference that the camera has assigned to that file. Now auto white balance, whether it be used in Lightroom or whether it be used in the camera, is about as accurate as auto exposure, i.e. it's probably got a better than 50% success rate, but it's not successful all of the time. So you will want to override that auto white balance. And so uh, I'm going to show you some Im images where I, I've act done just that. So in this image I've lowered um, the temperature slider, the temp slider, um, moved it to the left to cool the image down. Now um, the temperature is given in uh, uh, degrees Kelvin, that's what the K stands for, thousands of degrees Kelvin. And I've lowered this to minus 600 degrees Kelvin lower than the auto. And this has significantly changed the color distribution in the image. I'll just go back so you can remember predominantly yellow, green, warm tones there. Now we're getting some cooler tones flooding um, those um, background tones. And what I've, I've done here is as well as um, uh, coming to a white balance that is a lot more accurate than auto white balance guessed at, I'm also getting a uh, color com complementary colors between the cooler tones and the warm tones uh, creating that nice composition of color and I tend to look for this uh, quite a lot when I'm editing if possible and when appropriate uh, to give you an example this is a picture of my daughter on a local pier um, at twilight and again it's gone the auto white balance has gone for predominantly warm tones. I think it's uh, overcompensating for the large amounts of cool blue sky in the background, which is why this is overly warm in my instance. Now we can click on the auto and select a specific white balance from that list. We could uh, move it from as shot to auto to see whether Lightroom does a better job. Typically auto and as shot are usually very, very similar. So in that instance, that won't resolve this problem. So what I've done is again, just manually dragging that temperature slider to the left, cool the image down. I've dragged it 700 degrees Kelvin lower than the auto. And again, that creates these complementary colors. Um, the blue sky, uh, which is a comp complementing that the warm hues of that skin. And for me, this is a much uh, better color composition uh, than the as shot. So you won't often know whether you can improve on the auto white balance until you physically drag these sliders. It's always worth five or 10 seconds of your time just to see whether the color uh, white balance can improve your image. 
again another auto white balancing camera this one's probably a lot closer to being uh, accurate to the scene that I was photographing but I've decided to be a little bit creative in this instance and this time move the tint slider this is the controls the green magenta balance uh, below the yellow blue balance and uh, basically by pushing in a little bit more magenta I've created those complementary colors between a blue that is going just a little bit purple now and sort of the um, uh, orange yellow tones in the image that uh, appear on the pier itself so I'm forcing those complementary colors rather than worrying too much about color accuracy I'm now chasing complementary colors instead here is an image that I captured from Eureka Tower one of the higher vantage points in Melbourne looking out towards the bay where I live and again this is the as shot and if I just um, show you just by moving that temperature slider to the left, this time more than two and a half thousand degrees Kelvin lower, we get those beautiful complementary colors between the cool shadow tones and the warm tungsten lights of the cars driving home um, in the evening uh, glow there. And this gives me the perfect color compos composition that I was chasing in this instance. So uh, here is another auto white balance and this time the auto white balancing camera has created quite a cool rendition in this instance. And uh, again, I'm not so interested in color accuracy. I just decided to use color as an emotive tool to express the drama of something going on, which is basically a storm front rolling in over my hometown, um, over the bay there. And so I'm not really worried about, is this accurate? I'm worried about how this feels um, and I want to communicate to, uh, that feeling to you as the viewer. Now, once when I was in Western Australia and I was editing my sand dune images, I looked over at another photographer editing his images and he was making all of his sand dunes blue. I have to admit to raising an eyebrow going blue. Hmm, interesting. But what I, what I saw was, you know, he was being, um, he was using uh, the big rolling sand dunes as like waves of the ocean rolling around, albeit a lot slower than the waves in an ocean, and uh, trying to communicate that uh, peaceful uh, scene and that, that cool serenity of, uh, of this, uh, the rolling sand dunes, and also linking it maybe to the ocean as well. And so we can use color uh, for very emotional creative responses here rather than again representing reality. Uh, color. Uh, we'll move on now not just to white balance but also two of the most important sliders which are called vibrance and saturation. On the surface these two sliders do a very similar thing but they have different algorithms that are driving each of those sliders. Just a, just a shortcut this, so I'm just going to say that vibrance is used much more than saturation. Saturation tends to grab all colors, whether they're saturated or not, whether they're rich and vibrant already or not, and push that vibrance of all of the colors equally. There is no uh, measured response depending on whether the color is already saturated or is quite a pastel tone. It just pushes them all equally. So what this can do in some instances is push colors that are already saturated and it'll push them what's called out of gamut. It'll make them so saturated that we actually lose texture and detail inside of those color surfaces. So they start to look like extruded plastic. If, however, we move the vibrant slider, the vibrant slider recognizes colors that are already saturated and moves those at a slower amount to the colors that are less saturated. It also protects Caucasian skin tones from uh, taking on this very unnatural orange glow. So it does protect a sense of reality when working with those. To get a good idea of how these sliders work, it is worth 
pushing them to their extremes to see what happens. For instance, if we grab that vibrant slider and push it all of the way to the left, uh, we'll still end up with some col colors that have a little bit of saturation. These are the colors that had most of the saturation when it started. So it almost fully desaturated the pastel colors and uh, doesn't fully desaturated the saturated colors. So on, uh, alternatively, if we pull the saturation slider, it would pull all of the colors out equally from all of the colors and you'd end up with a monochrome image. Uh, this is not the way, by, uh, by the way, that you create black and white images with the greatest degree of control, but this is what happens when you drag the saturation slider all of the way to the left. And knowing how those sliders work and playing with them, you can actually learn that we can actually move both sliders maybe in different directions to get some special effects. For instance, in this image, I'm desaturating all of the pastel colors fully, but restoring all of the um, saturated colors fully. So I'm limiting the color palette just and leaving only those colors that were saturated in the beginning. To show you a more subtle version of this uh, in uh, playing out, here is a full color version of this image. I want it to be mostly monochrome but without going to black and white. So I've lowered the vibrant slider to make all of the colors of low saturation very mute but restored um, some of the key colors at play in, in this image which are those yellows on those bollards in the foreground. I've restored those fully just by raising the saturation in this instance to plus 30. So now let's move on to color HSL, hue, saturation and luminance, sometimes referred to as the color mix inside of Lightroom CC. And here is the color mix. Now we have those rings of color uh, on the top row there. Those are referred to as the hue. Uh, these are the names of color like red is a hue, green is a hue, cyan, magenta, they're all hues. Now we can push a hue, so for instance we can push a blue to cyan or push a, um, uh, a yellow to orange, that is basically adjusting the hue. So that is the first thing to note. One of the things that when you're editing an image you might come a color across a color which you find is may be distracting. For instance, in this example, I find the purple and blues in uh, Gilbert Namala's shirt here a little bit distracting to this portrait, which I want to be a little bit more monochromatic than it currently is. So what I've done is I've targeted the purples and dragged both the saturation and the luminance. The luminance is the brightness of the color and drag that down. So we end up with a monochrome shirt. I might also need to do the same thing with the blues in this image. Now a word of warning here, as an illustrative photographer, editorial photography, I'm at liberty to do this and sell my images to magazines. But if you're a photojournalist and your images are considered as a document or a factual record of what happened in reality, you are prohibited from making these color adjustments. Um, ironically, you can actually create black and white images. You can strip all of the color away, but you can't modify individual colors. This is against the rules of photography for photojournalists who are there to try and tell some aspect of truth to their documentary photo essays or narratives. But for me as an editorial photography, I may be looking at uh, this uh, meerkat and go, yeah, I know these meerkats come from Africa and that green grass just looks typically out of place. It looks like it's a zoo image, which of course it is a zoo image, but I could um, pull your attention away from that background tone just by moving the hue maybe more towards uh, the browns, uh, desaturating those greens and making those greens darker. So now your attention is going to be fully focused on that meerkat and not drift to those very saturated greens in the background of this image. So this is a, a very useful editing tool to control the way our viewers see and use our images. 
Now occasionally when you're editing an image, a uh, color that you're editing might sit between two of those named colors. For instance, we've got greens and yellows and that green grass I was editing had some aspect of yellow in that green grass and some aspect of green. So you can actually adjust both of these colors simultaneously using the target adjustment tool. Just tap on that target adjustment tool. The arrow is pointing to it in this slide. Then tap on the image, hold your finger on the image and drag up or down. And you'll see on the top row there, the hue um, numbers will start to adjust. So it's an on image adjustment. You don't have to be moving the sliders. You can actually just tap and work directly on the image itself. Very good for people who are maybe slightly colorblind and not knowing which color it is that they're trying to edit. They can simply tap on it and adjust it darker or, or give it more saturation or change the nature of that hue. Okay, to give you an example, you can also do this with monochrome. This might seem a bit bizarre, adjusting color when there is no color, but that color also has a brightness value. So I've converted this image to black and white just by simply tapping black and white or B and W in that color panel. And then we have what's called a gray mix down below. So I can use the uh, target adjustment tool or if I know that typically skies are blue, I could just uh, touch that blue pin and then drag the brightness of that uh, sky uh, much, much darker. So you can see we can have significant control over how we represent black and white by adjusting the brightness values of individual colors within our image. To give you another example, and it comes back to that green grass approach, uh, again captured at the zoo, got this beautiful gorilla looking at me, eyeballing me, but the, the green grass again is very vivid. I know these gorillas do surround themselves with very um, abundant green foliage in the, in the wilds of Africa, but I, I just want to draw your attention just to that gorilla stare there. So this is a creative approach at desaturating and pulling the luminance values down and um, and getting that gorilla st uh, stare uh, now the feature and, and focus point of this image. Be sure to check out all of the movies in this Lightroom CC Masterclass series. There's also a supporting ebook that you can download from my website. Just head over to www.markgaylor.com and then look for that downloads link. If you find any of my resources useful, just consider making a small donation. This will help me create future learning resources. I also host a, a Patreon uh, site. This is uh, going to allow you to join Q&A forums where you'll have your individual questions answered and also attend seminars. I'll also give a photo critique service. Okay, so uh, thumbs up if you've enjoyed the movie and I'll catch you online next time.